Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Very Cold Lasagna Podcast, your place for all those filthy casual takes on the world of sports. I am your host, Dylan Lasagna. This is episode number 181 of this icy yet spicy sports podcast. In this episode, we're here to talk about the other NFL Conference Championship Sunday game, the 2023 edition, and that was the NFC Championship game between the three-seeded Detroit Lions and the number one seeded San Francisco 49ers, which is my team, ladies and gentlemen. So that's what we're here to talk about in this episode. We've already talked about the other uh, NFL Conference Championship game, which was the AFC title game between the three-seeded Kansas City Chiefs and the top seed Baltimore Ravens. We talked about that in the previous episode, episode 180. So if you missed that one, go check that out after this episode. So you can catch up on that. We already know who's going to face uh, the winner of this one, uh, that being the Kansas City Chiefs. So they're lying in wait to see who's going to face them in Las Vegas in the Super Bowl. Who would that be? Well, let's talk about it. What do you want to talk about? This NFC Championship uh, between the Lions and my 49ers. So let's talk about this game uh, after a little bit of housekeeping before we get the ball rolling. So follow me on social media, on Twitter, uh, sorry, the X and Instagram at Very Cold Lasagna. And from all my audio listeners out there, um, whether it's on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, make sure you rate and review the show, one to five stars. And with that review, make sure give me a compliment, give me some feedback. Um, whether it's good or bad, um, areas of improvement, what have you. Um, it helps me um, re- review, uh, review what I need to work on in terms of the show. So for all my audio listeners out there, give me like that rating or uh, any feed of uh, some advice that you'd like to give. Anyway, for all my YouTube listen- uh, watchers, listeners, what have you out there, make sure you smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, leave a comment with your own takes, on each and every topic that I talk about here on Vera Cold Lasagna, and share this with your friends, share this with your neighbors, share this with a stranger, share this with your coworkers, share this with whoever you want to share this with, um, with my filthy casual takes on wrestling, the NFL, and the very rare other sport that I like to talk about here on Vera Cold Lasagna, whether it's good or bad takes um, that I have, just spread the good word or the bad word of mouth that is the icy yet spicy podcast. That is very cold lasagna. So with that being said, let's talk about our main topic of the day. And that is this NFC championship game between the three seeded Detroit Lions and the number one seeded San Francisco 49ers. Both of these teams coming in with some things on the line uh, for the three seeded Detroit Lions. This, they were making their first NFC championship game appearance since 1991, over 30 years. So essentially, their sec just their second NFC title game um, that they were appearing in. That first one didn't end so well. They lost to the Washington redacted name. Now they're known as the Washington Commanders um, in pretty blown out uh, blowout fashion. And that same Commanders team went on to win the Super Bowl against the Buffalo Bills. So for the Lions, they were looking to erase doubt. They were looking to um, erase. Uh, their longevity, their bad history, uh, oh, we can't do anything, um, and make their first ever Super Bowl, and that was trying to overcome a San Francisco 49ers team that was trying to gain some redemption um, from the last two NFC Championship games. So speaking of which, they're making their third NFC Championship game appearance, having lost to the LA Rams in heartbreaking fashion in 2021, and then, of course, last year, to the Philadelphia Eagles in a game where they had no starting quarterbacks um, in the last in that last one. Yeah, we all remember how that one went, but that's something I don't want to talk about <laughs> anymore. So anyway, um, yeah, it became a battle of hope, scarcity versus redemption uh, for the other team. So a lot of was on the line for both of these teams in Santa Clara. So these two teams did not meet each other in the past regular season. Um, They last met each other, just like with the other AFC title game between the Chiefs and the Ravens. They last met each other back in 2021. So a little over two years ago, uh, the Niners beat the Lions in week one in Detroit, where Dan Campbell made his first game as a head coach and Jared Goff had his first game as a Detroit Lion. So a lot of firsts 
for the, the Lions in that week one game against the 49ers at home in Detroit. And the Niners were a little bit of a much different team uh, back then, different starting quarterback. Uh, then different starting quarterback now for the Lions, kind of a slightly different team uh, back then, slightly different team now. I mean, a little pretty much better than the one that we saw uh, back in their first rebuilding year. But here they are now making their first ever NFC Championship game. And for them, they ratted out two home playoff wins. And here they were trying to pull off uh, the impossible against a stacked San Francisco team. And oh boy, did they make a first impression in this game. With the odds stacked against them, they really punched the 49ers in the mouth. And they made them pay like early. You know, the Niners got the won the coin toss. They deferred, and the Lions really made them pay for it. Um, because it only took just four. Just four plays to get into the end zone. Three of those four plays were attacking the 49ers' biggest weakness. The run. The run defense. Uh, a running defense that had been struggling so much uh, as of late. Uh, the last month or two. Like, I don't understand it. Like, I really didn't understand it. Um, especially in this game. David Montgomery pounded the rock in the middle. Sam Laporta attacked the side whenever he got a, a pass from Jared Goff. And they had their defense fooled with Jamison Williams getting an end around from Jared Goff, shaking off a bunch of defenders on the way to the end zone. A 7 to nothing lead with just two minutes into the game. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck was that tackling? Like, on that way to the end zone for the 49ers. It's like... Oh, it's like, oh, I don't want to touch him. It's like, oh, oh I missed. It's like, it's like, it's like Jameson Williams was covered in butter. Or maybe the Niners ate so much Butterfinger before the game. It's like, this is piss poor tackling that I'm seeing again. And it is only the first drive of the game. Like, what are they teaching them there? I mean, yeah, I'm no football player, but it's like, damn, make the tackle upon initial contact. Like, geez. So anyway... Facing a 7-0 deficit just two minutes into the game, on their opening possession, Brock Purdy nearly throws an interception to corner Camp Sutton on, like, I think it was, like, the third play. But Brandon Ayuk had to go play defense f to stop it from happening because, damn, I don't know what happened. Like, maybe Brock Purdy overthrew Brandon Ayuk um, on that one. It was just like, geez. It's like, kind of scary. Imagine that thought of throwing a pick that early. It's like, ugh. But anyway, at least Brock Purdy threw a dart to Debo Samuel, who did play in this game despite questions about um, about his shoulder. Was it good to go? Uh, but on Friday, he was good to go, so that's a good thing um, because Debo Samuel is a key part of that offense, like, really. But unfortunately, all they could muster was a field goal, uh, a field goal, or so we thought, because uh, <laughs> uh, they couldn't get that right. Jake Moody, the rookie kicker, the controversial now we can say rookie kicker because he missed to the right uh and it stayed a seven nothing game like oh boy yeah may maybe we can roast that third round rookie kicker now it's like oh my god i was thinking to myself you know we go on this slightly long drive and we're kind of performing like butt cheeks and i'm just thinking to myself why does kyle shanahan our head coach Always have his team starting off very slow. Why does he always have his team starting off underperforming on both sides of the ball? It's like, we got to come out starting hot out of the gates, man. This is not like two years ago. This is not five years ago. We need to start off fast, hot. Like, come on. Like, stop looking down upon the competition. Because the Lions continue to stand on business. They're ready to roar. Because they killed San Francisco on the ground again with their... They're fast, rookie, running back, Jameer Gibbs. Um, there's a reason why they drafted him number 12, because he he's so fast. He's so elusive. Ran around the edges of various Niners defenders. And that rushing attack of Gibbs and Montgomery continued to lead the way with Montgomery notching a goal line score. Uh, and before the first quarter ended, 14 to nothing. And you look at that touchdown. You look at that touchdown drive. That 49ers defense was getting killed in more late than one by two people. Two! Two people! 
Like, where's the pressure on Jared Goff? Where is the urgency to stop the run? Uh, you know, on both sides of the um, both sides of the defensive front, like in the middle, on the edge. Like, my gosh. And I know we're talking about this like very late, out of date. But it's like, damn, these are my these were my feelings. Like during the game. It was like shit. Like, what like where was everything? Where was everything? Especially this would be how I feel like if they saw that like somehow made it. They somehow made a miracle to the Super Bowl. Like if, if this this was how they were playing in the Super Bowl. So anyway, let's get to the second quarter. You know, Brock Purdy and the offense, you know, they at least got it going. They at least get it going in the next series. Purdy finally allowed himself, or at least Kyle Shanahan allowed himself to bootleg out of the pocket. In other words, they let him go out of the pocket on on the initial snap of the shotgun. Um out in that little formation where he snaps the ball from the center. Um and he runs out of this of the pocket. So Kyle Shanahan finally allows him out of the pocket because in that game, in the divisional game against Green Bay, he was mostly in the pocket. I don't understand why, but Purdy, from at least my perspective, I mean, I'm no expert. I'm just a filthy casual um, podcaster. He works better when he's out of the pocket. He's a better out-of-pocket quarterback, per se. I mean, he kind of has that balance, at least in my eyes. So he goes a big pass to fullback Kyle Juszczyk, who makes a good leaping grab. Meanwhile, Christian McCaffrey goes a bit on a tear, both on the ground and in the receiving game. He has a big catch and run in between um, that sets them up near the goal line. And then two plays later, he punches it in. Cut, at least cuts the line's lead 14-7 to early in the second. But now it was on that 49ers overpaid uh, defense that needed to start playing like an actual defense. Play what you're actually worth. Um, and at least they finally played like one after allowing Detroit to um, get towards midfield, start with starting by tackling David Montgomery behind the line on a first down. And then you had Nick Boza sack Jared Goff on a second down. It was like a throwdown, like he was in WWE. And then you had Dre Greenlaw uh, stop Sam Laporta um, short of a first down and on third and long. So, hey, at least you finally get them the punt. Congratulations. But this is a little bit alarming. Uh, Drain Greenlaw on that tackle, he was in a lot of pain. Like, shit. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, oh, fuck. He's in a lot of pain. He's, like, dragging his shoulder. Um, and I thought, fuck, we better not lose his ass. But fortunately enough, um, it was just a singer that I think it was Aaron Andrews that reported it. And it was just that. So he looked he, he looked good to go on the next series. So. We, could, we at least could breathe a sigh of relief. So, unfortunately, we didn't. We couldn't. We didn't breathe a sigh of relief on the next, on the next drive for the offense because uh, on third down, Purdy made a pressure-induced pick on on third down. Which you know, it, it, looking at that replay, it was actually tipped at the line. But it's just like, damn. Malcolm Rodriguez got the interception because the offensive line can't protect their damn quarterback, like. This is what happens when, you know, you don't invest in an actual offensive line outside of Trent Williams. Like, maybe Aaron, uh, yeah, Aaron Bax is having a down year. He, he had a good last year. But it's just like, damn it. Invest in a O-line to protect your quarterback. He's like the wall to protect your most important investment on the team. It's like, damn. Like, can they do that in the offseason? Meanwhile, the Lions took advantage of that turnover with just, again, five or less plays. It only took them five plays to get back in the end zone. Two big darts from Jared Goff to Sam Laporta and Amon Ross 8 Brown, both of whom were already having a good game on just manageable chunk plays. And then one play later, Jameer Gibbs, the rookie back, rambled, scrambled, made everyone look stupid. On the 49ers, 15, uh, 15 yards, and all of a sudden, 21-7. to 7. Six minutes to go. This was becoming a blowout. This was becoming a rout. And it was only six minutes to go. This was embarrassing. This was an embarrassment. Um, in front of the 49ers faithful. Like, come on, man. 
And it's it wasn't getting any better on offense because Detroit's defense had Christian McCaffrey C M C on lockdown. They they had him glued to the core. And then Brock Purdy, for whatever reason, still stuck in cement in a cement pocket. Whether it's by his own will or Kyle Shanahan's making him be in a cement pocket that they don't want him to escape out of. And no points. Three and out. No advancement of the ball. It's like, damn. They're, they're really shooting themselves in the foot. And speaking of shooting themselves in the foot, San Francisco on defense. The Lions offense continuing to kill them in more ways than one. Getting back into scoring position. And as they get to the two-minute warning, um, and after that, they were facing a 30 and 18 after like another sack by by one of their uh, players. I think it was Nick Boza again. But nonetheless, they were facing a third and 18. And guess what happens? They convert the damn third and 18 because they can't tackle. They can't cover. They're going too far um, in coverage. It's like, get closer. Go man to man. Stop going like spread out zone. Zone, you know, spread out, uh, prevent and all that. I mean, again, no expert, but still. You're going to, your, your, your formations are like spread out. You need to go like man to man. Anyway, I'm going to, I don't know, man. I was just thinking, like, it's third 18, and you allowed that big play to happen to Amon R.C. Brown to get into scoring range. Like, where was the pressure um, from that overpaid defensive line? Uh, Mine is Chase Young, of course. Uh, where was Steve Wilkes in his play calling? It's like, why isn't he dialing up a blitz, at least? I get it. He has that PTSD from uh, the Vikings game back, at, back in October. Uh, maybe that's why he, he rarely calls a blitz anymore. But anyway, San Francisco at least managed to hold them to a seven, uh, 24 uh, a field goal. So going to halftime, it was 24 to 7. And oh boy, you know, I was thinking at that time, uh, was this even, what, can we even come back from this? Like, I was literally watching with my family, and I was thinking, like, is this like with the way they were playing, with with the way everyone was playing, especially on defense? Can can they even come back from this? Can they even try to come back from this? Can they like do something uh, to adjust at halftime? Because in that stadium, you could clear, you literally hear loud Jared Goff chants before the break, like loud Jared Goff chants. So, I'm gonna say it again: Where the fuck was that defense? Like, no desire from that overpaid as fuck front of Nick Boza other than two sacks. Javon Hargrave and Eric Armstead in the interior. Where were they? Don't give me the excuse of, oh, Detroit has a great offensive line. They have, like, more than five uh, offensive linemen in the front. Because great teams figure out solutions on how to attack it. Defensive coordinators have great solutions on how to attack it. The 49ers so far in that first half had not. They did not on Sunday, at least in the first half. That same front also had no desire to stop the run in the middle. That same defense also had no desire to stop the run on the edges, on the outside corners. It basically came, like, at that point, the NFC title game against the Packers in 2019, except it turned against them. They were the one, They were the Packers, and the Lions were the 49ers. They, the Lions were having their own Raheem Mostert game against them. So... Yeah, man, I, like this was this was bad. This was really bad, especially considering the, the, I didn't even take into consideration the issues on offense. Like we know how crap the offensive line has been all season outside of Trent Williams, but like I don't know why Kyle Shanahan wouldn't let his quarterback go out of the pocket, um, unless maybe it's a party thing. But like, damn, like especially when I was gonna, when I'm going to talk about net in the second half, it's just like why why isn't Kyle Shanahan Letting his quarterback go out of the pocket because it's affecting the offense. Because as I just as I talked about a little while ago, Purdy is a more effective quarterback when he's allowed to like make some plays um, out of the pocket. If the pressure's starting to come to him and he's aware of it, he can run out, get out of the pocket, throw that ball to whether it's Ayuk, Kittle, Debo. He's a more effective, you know, off off the off the run. Uh, out of pocket quarterback. I mean, he doesn't do it all, uh, all the time, but at least when he recognizes it, 
He can make some plays happen, unlike compared to Jimmy G. So, I don't know, man. Meanwhile, the Lions were just having everything work uh, in their favor. And that didn't even consider the fact that Jared Goff barely threw the ball. <laughs> but when he did, it was chunk throws um, that Laporta or St. Brown turned into big yards after catch. Um, more importantly, their rushing attack of David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs severely destroying San Francisco. So, yeah, you know, there's still second half of football. But it's just at that point, like I said, can the Niners really come back from this um, with how they were playing? Because man, they were really breaking a lot of hearts on Sunday. Um, it didn't look like a comeback was in the works uh, with the way they were playing. But if they didn't get one going, I, I was calling I, I was calling for jobs. I, I was, uh, my heart was telling me if they don't if they don't find a way to stop this embarrassment or if they if they allowed more points to get on the board I wanted jobs to be had I wanted jobs to be had uh, especially Steve Wolf's job I, I like I was that serious like I wanted jobs to be had immediately after the game so let's talk about the second half because this this was insane like this second half was wild. So the Niners, um, they started the ball um, to start the second half. Um, and they, atta- they started attacking, finally, Detroit's biggest weakness. And that was their passing defense, which had been a problem all year long. Um, and that was, the- at least the Niners' offensive line, they finally started to hold up. But once they- and once they did, like I said, it started attacking Detroit's biggest weakness in their passing de- uh, defense. The Eagle got it going for the fir- their best drive since the second one in the second quarter, which was like forever. Um, And then Jawan Jennings also made an impressive one-handed catch on third and short. Um, Brock Purdy just like floated that thing in the air, like off uh, off his back foot. Um, And Jawan Jennings made this like leaping one-handed catch um, that Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olsen were like, kind of like Jim Nance and Tony Roma were in the prior game. They were like stroking the worm a little. (laughs) Um, But unfortunately... We only managed to get three points out of it um, from Jake Moody, who thankfully made the field goal, um, <laughs> cut it down to 24 to 10. Uh, but damn, David Montgomery continued to kill that Niner defense on the ground. And you notice that during this drive, Steve Wilkes is starting to find, find different solutions um, to stop the run. And, you know, that's what I know has been. I miss Clint Farrell, um, an unsung hero of that Niners defensive line because you know, at least he managed to like help stop the run a, a little bit. But you notice during in this drive, he's trying to find many different rotations on each and every down. They started um started having Eric Armstead starting to play at the edge, something that I have barely seen out of him. And then you saw like Javon Hargrave, Javon Kinlaw um in the interior. And then you have Chase uh either Chase Young or Randy Gregory in there. It's like these rotations are weird. <laughs> um you also had Kevin Givens make a rare appearance. So it's just like your defensive line depth is being really tested um, this desperately um, with your inability to stop the run. But at least your overpaid San Francisco defense finally made a big stop on fourth down, finally gained that pressure that was desperately needed on Jared Goff, and they forced an incomplete on on downs, like forcing Josh Reynolds to drop the ball. So at least you got something out of that, finally. And then... That's when they really got it going. That's when this is where the turning point of the game really came along. And I know, you know, I, I thought it was like a lucky break and all that. But, hey, they'll take it. They will take it. I, I didn't think it would it happen. But um, after a chunk gained by Debo, got the offense going, um, this is where the spark came in. Purdy, given time to throw for once, he heaves one up to Brandon Ayuk. I thought this was going to get intercepted because it was, it was really overthrown. But then... The the ball deflects off of Kindle Van uh, Kindle Vendor uh, Vendor uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name but Kindle Vendor um, and then it deflects off his helmet and then it goes into the hands of Brandon Ayuk like he never gave up on that ball so Ayuk gets the deflected helmet ball um, into his hands and then I thought it was a touchdown but he got touched so at least still sets him up in prime position and then three plays later. Purdy finds Ayuk again in the end zone, and well, damn, it's a touchdown game, twenty-four to seventeen, and then that finally woke up the defense too, because on the very next on the very next possession, on the first play, 
um, of the Lions offense. Sean Gibson to safety forces a big fumble uh, on Jameer Gibbs. And Eric Armstead immediately came through with the instant recover. And all of a sudden, the Niners are back in business. Like, holy shit. Uh, Brock Purdy um, uh, um, responds with a big 20 plus yard scrambler. Again, prime scoring position. And then Christian McCaffrey punches it in two plays later, ties the game up, and it's a new ball game. New ball game, 24 all, erased a 17 point deficit, and holy crap. Like, holy hell, man. I, I really did not uh, think that they were going to do it, but it takes a lot of momentum. It takes one play to change change the course of the game. And I'll admit, <laughs> I'll admit, I'll, I'll eat crow when I'm wrong <laughs> about this Niners team that they have the, they, they got the willpower. They got the power. They got the game. It's, whatever that stupid ass damage control theme song is. <laughs> but they, they brought, they, they brought the will in, the, uh, in their ways. So anyway, it's a new ball game. It's 24 all. And the Lions just coughed up a 17 point lead. And we were about to find a whole lot about the Lions after letting San Francisco come back in this one. Um, but unfortunately for them, they dropped two big passes. Um, Sam Laporta and Josh Reynolds, that is, on back-to-back plays. And they were quickly forced out to punt. Not exactly good um, for for Jared Goff and crew. So going to the fourth quarter, um, things were starting to heat up for San Francisco. Things were back on their side. Um because Purdy and the offense, um, yeah, they got humming. They got um, back in scoring position um, with some good play, good passing plays. But um, maybe Purdy got a little too comfortable with the scrambling position, uh, his new scrambling ability um, that Kyle Shanahan finally gifted to him. <laughs> because he took two uh, straight bad sacks in the red zone um, that cost him a touchdown. But hell, uh, they still take a twenty-seven to twenty-four. Uh, Advantage. They finally get their first lead of the night off a field goal. Uh, but I felt like, you know, they could have had a touchdown. Um, he had Ayuk wide open, but just didn't see him. And then the second sack, um, he could have checked it down to either Kittle or see him, uh, Christian McCaffrey. But he, he got sacked by, I think it was Justin Houston or some, somebody else. But, oh, well, they, they, they'll take what they can get. It was now a advantage for the 49ers. So now the Lions were finding themselves down, uh, having to play catch up. And they were right there, ready to get into scoring position with two solid chunk plays um, to Jamison Williams and David Montgomery. But the Niners uh, finally got that consistent pressure that they were looking for um, that helped them out in the second half and sold them out for to a fourth down and around around a little, little bit over the 30 or 40 yard line of their side. But Dan, this is where Dan Campbell really killed this team. Instead of having his kicker, Michael Badley, tie the game um, at 27 at all, Dan Campbell got really aggressive. Because remember, Dan Campbell is a really aggressive coach. Um, that if he, if he For fourth and short situations, he goes for it. Um, rather than having kick, uh, his kicker um, you know, get, the, get the points. Um, and I think this is his second kicker. He released his first one like late in the season. So... He went for it on fourth and three, but he dearly paid the price for it. Jared Goff had his pass to Amon Ross St. Brown fall incomplete. And keep in mind that that was Amon Ross St. Brown's first target all second half long. So big oof for the Detroit Lions. Meanwhile, for the 49ers, they were trying to eat clock and try to put the game away for good with a few chunk plays, try to get back in scoring position. And well, they got they got it. Two big runs from Brock Purdy and Christian McCaffrey and CMC set up a goal line touchdown uh, for his back quarterback. Um, and that was after Christian McCaffrey took a bad, a <laughs> bad landing on his head. Uh, but he's, he looked okay afterwards, but nonetheless, the more important thing was the Niners were up. Now they were the ones up with a 10 point lead um, with just a little bit over two minutes to go. 34 to 24 Niner advantage. And, Time was really on the, uh, against the Lions. Time was running down. The Lions were either going to make history um, or they were going to, what they always have done, they were going to line. 
So we are really about to see what the Lions were made of. So Jared Goff still managed to march his team down to the end zone. Um, and with a minute left, cut the lead down 34 to 31, tossed it up to Jamison Williams. Um, but it was still like over a minute left. You had two timeouts remaining. Um, your season was on the line um, with one last desperate onside kick. So they had a chance. They had a chance to recover the onside kick. Um, it bounced up in the air for a good while, but unfortunately for the Lions, it was not to be. George Kittle recovers it, and that's the game. That's the game. That's the, the season for the Lions, and the Niners are back in the Super Bowl, going to Vegas 34-31. to 31. It's like, like, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I have, like, no clue. Like, I have no freaking clue how the 49ers came back from that one. Like, really, I have no clue. Yeah, I know. They made, like, I get it. They made some adjustments. They they found a way to stop the run, finally, um, it, late in the, in the third quarter. But it's just, like, everything prior to that, man, it looked like they really didn't deserve to um, win that game because everything's so, so lost for them in the first half. Like, the, it was the same issues that plagued them in the Packer game. Lack of a running defense. The inability to stop Aaron Jones. Except this time, they couldn't stop that two headed attack of David Montgomery and, and Jameer Gibbs getting killed in chunk plays. Like Jared Goff didn't even throw it deep. He was just like, oh, let's chunk, let's throw it like five to 20 yards to Sam Laporta or Amon Ross St. Brown. Those were his two primary targets. And then, you know, Jameson Williams uh, got a little bit involved, but they were still killing him on chunk plays. And then the defense was make, missing a lot of tackles like they've done late in the season. So it was like the Lions really burned them alive. But then somewhere along the way, I mean, aside from the Brandon Ayuk, the bobble catch, something really changed. Like they finally woke up, limited the run. And then Kyle Shannon, I guess, was finally like, you know what? Maybe now we, I guess we can finally uh, allow Brock Purdy to break free, run out of the pocket. And then once all those things came together, it was like, well, damn. They were on the surge. They were on the comeback train. And the pressure was finally being induced on Goff too. And, well, they did it. They they pulled off another NFC title comeback. Um, not in the same similar fashion as they did against the, the Atlanta Falcons like over a decade ago. But I feel like this one was more gutsier, more uh, crazier, more like... I thought it was like impossible, man. <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it really... Impossible with the way they were like playing, like uninspired, um, unmotivated, but something really woke them up in the second half. And I'm really glad it did. Um, but they did it. They really did it. Now for the Detroit side, like, man, they had every right to win this game. They had everything set up for them, but it's just like, damn, they just got out. They just got in their own way. They just got in their own way. Um, I'm not like, I don't know where you can really pinpoint like what happened in their collapse, but if there was at least one or two things, um, to pinpoint at it's, well, the motto that they live, that most people have said on, on their, their team live or die by their aggressiveness, um, or at least the over aggressiveness of Dan Campbell, because, um, well, there were like there's those fourth down plays, um, in Dan Campbell's decision to go for it rather than have Michael Bagley, uh, for as a little bit un- unreliable as he has been. But those six points would have made the difference, um, in, in that game. I mean, it would have been a difference maker between a three point loss to the 49ers or a three to six point win to go to their first ever Super Bowl. So those decisions came really costly uh, for the Lions because they did so many things well on both sides of the ball, like uh, running it with Montgomery and and Gibbs until the Niners managed to, to stuff that out. Um, and then Goff playing a pretty solid game until, you know, he started getting pressure. But it's just like, this was a game re- that they did really well in until the, the second half. Letting them come back. 
Um, and then also, you know, those flaw, that, that big flaw, other flaw coming in, their passing defense, it's just like really started to kick in once the uh, Niners started to get those explosive plays in. It's like it's something they could not contain. So a lot of those things really cost the, uh, the Lions a big major chance to go to the Super Bowl, their first ever one. I mean, that's not to say that they'll never make, they'll never get there, but it's just like, damn, this was their best chance to do it and do it in a big statement. So tough. That's just that's that is a really tough way um, to lose that to lose that game. So let's wrap it up with an early look for the offseason for the Detroit Lions. Um, so like I said, um, this was their best shot. This was potentially the Lions' best shot to um, make it to the Super Bowl. And even Dan Campbell said it himself. Because, you know, um, I'll say this. Some of that may be true. Um, you know, what Dan Campbell said, you know, and the fact that this may have been their only shot um, to make it to the Super Bowl. Because, you know, considering free agency um, and, you know, the competition getting only tougher from here with the Packers uh, look seemingly having their franchise quarterback in Jordan Love um, and then possibly, you know, replenishing in free agency as well. And who knows what the bear, if the Bears finally competent um, to get get the pieces together, where it's around Justin Fields or a new quarterback, and the competition around the NFC also getting tougher. I think the Lions, you know, they proved their mettle. They, they, they could be a team that could stick around um, in the next couple of years. They, they proved their mettle by making it this deep into the playoffs. But if they want to get back to the NFC Championship game, or, and do the impossible this time and make the Super Bowl, I think they have several things to address in this um, coming offseason. And I think that starts um, with potentially, lo- if they lose their offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, to one of the last remaining uh, head coaching uh, vacancies, whether it's in Seattle or in Washington, then that's the main priority that they have to fill because that's a serious void. Um, that's going to be lost because Ben Johnson was key in helping Jared Goff, helping the running uh, running game with Amon, uh, not Amon Rossi Brown, but Jameer Gibbs and Dan Montgomery this season. So he was a key part of scheming up that offense. And if they lose him, that's a that's a big loss of how um, of how that offense runs. And in terms of the personnel, um, well, Brad Holmes and Camp, J- Coach Campbell. Um, they got to start with addressing their biggest weakness, which is their passing defense. Um, they got to invest in at least a cornerback or two and maybe also get uh, Aiden Hutchinson a running mate on the opposite side of the uh, defensive line. I don't, whether they do that through the free agency or the draft, they should address the uh, least the part of their defense. I would start in the secondary by getting in a cornerstone cornerback. It'll be a late pick, but hey, you gotta address that de- that secondary at some point. Um, they don't have many high priority free agents, which is good. Um, they have around fifty eight million dollars uh, in cap space, so good amount of money to spend. They just gotta spend it wisely. Um, so they at least spend it on their own key free agents, which include Jonah Jackson at guard, receiver Josh Reynolds, safety CJ Gardner Johnson. Um, I would try to do as much as I can to uh, resign CJ Gardner Johnson and Jonah Jackson. So, I would rather I would keep those two and then try to get another big name um, to come to Detroit, maybe on the defensive side of the ball. So, yeah, the Lions have a good amount of things to address in the offseason um, if they want to get back to this point of time this current season. So, meanwhile, for my 49ers, they're going back to the, uh, to the Super Bowl after five years. Uh, well, five football years of... Well, not getting, uh, getting there since Super Bowl 54. So, whoopee. The stage is set, but the job's not done. Super Bowl 58, uh, they're going back for the first time since the 2019 season. And, well, look who they're facing. Look who they're facing um, from that same Super Bowl. A familiar foe in the Kansas City Chiefs. Of course, Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, and the Chiefs. The same foe that we lost to five football years ago so for those in the know or that don't know the Chiefs rallied back in the fourth quarter 
um, a, a 10 point deficit fourth quarter to beat the 49ers 31 to 20. They claimed their first title in what felt like over 50 years. And Patrick Mahomes won the MVP and the Niners never made it back since. Um, and for the Chiefs, that was only their first of now five Super Bowl appearances. So the Niners are are looking for, uh, they're, they're still looking for their sixth Lombardi trophy. But here they are 40 years later, they're looking at a Chiefs team on the verge of continuing their their dynasty, trying to trying to continue their dynasty and well, they still got a great one. Um, continuing their dynasty and creating the dynasty by trying to become the first repeat um, champion since the 2003 and 2004 New England Patriots. Um, so we'll see. These Niners might have a say in it um, as they try to achieve redemption uh, from that loss to Kansas City and. Finally, just finally bring home title number six. Like, oh man, I gotta, I really wanna, like, at least in my lifetime, my young lifetime, see the Niners win a Super Bowl. Like, is it too much to ask? Is it just too hard to ask for the Niners to, like, come through, finish the story, get redemption, and win title number six for me to see? Like, is it too much to ask? Like, come on. Like, pull, do it, just finish it. Like, get the redemption, man. Like, you got to play your best ball. Like, they have to play their best ball against the quarterback that beat their ass in the last time around and still has beat their ass in the regular season. So, they got, they really have to, they really have to pull through in this next, next meeting and where it matters most, and that is the Super Bowl, which people are saying, oh, it's going to be one of the worst Super Bowls of all time. So maybe it's how maybe because of how predictable um, the meeting of uh, this matchup ended up being, uh, how these two teams came together. I don't know. Taylor Swift. I don't know. Either way, yeah, the Niners are going to meet the Chiefs in the Super Bowl once again. Um, hopefully, it's a different result, but we'll talk more about it um, as we get closer and closer to the big game in a week and a half. So stay tuned for my preview of that game between the Niners and the Chiefs coming soon to a very cold lasagna podcast near you. But anyway, for now, that is it for my, my recap of the NFC Championship game that happened this past Sunday, a late out-of-date recap of it um, on this episode, episode number 180 of Very Cold Lasagna. What would you guys think about the, the Niners' win over the Detroit Lions to go to their eighth Super Bowl um, in their history? Um, and if you're a Lions fan, you know, I feel you. Um, I mean, this is like not me, me not knocking you because I do think, you know, as a Niner fan, I do think that you had a great season, like a season that exceeded all expectations. Like, um, even if you didn't make the, the big dance, um, uh, which is the Super Bowl, I do think that if you re if you continue to build, um, build pieces within your team, I do think that you could have another shot next year and, Perhaps finally get to that big dance that you that has been eluding you um, for a long ass time. Like seriously, you guys got it. You guys have a really good team going. Like I just hope that you guys can finally make it. Really. So anyway, that's it for this episode of Very Cold Lasagna. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this game in the comments on YouTube or on social media on Twitter or Instagram at Very Cold Lasagna. But for now. This is Dylan Lasagna signing out of another episode, episode number 180 of this Icy Yet Spicy podcast. And as always, keep that lasagna very cold in the fridge with your takes on the world of sports. We are on the, on the road to Super Bowl 58 between my Niners and the Chiefs. We'll talk more about that uh, coming soon. But until then, peace out.